All right, let's take our Bibles, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, and uh, we're going to be looking here tonight at a parable that I've titled, A Ready Wedding, A Ready Wedding. And as we look at this, we of course are, are considering um, this uh, passage in light of what we have already studied over the past two uh, two studies, uh, because what we're looking at is is in conjunction with something that was going on that Jesus was was uh, teaching his disciples about, and of course this would um, interact with the Pharisees and the chief priests as well. So let's go back to chapter number twenty one. The context of this uh, is found in verse number twenty three. Uh, where it says, and when he was coming to the temple, and the chief, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Right? And so he started off giving them the parable in verses 28 through 32 of the two sons. Um, and then he goes into chapter, or in verse number 33, and he gives them another parable of this householder and his uh, vineyard. Uh, and then he comes now to chapter 22 in verse number 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto them, or unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so as we look at this parable of the marriage feast, or what I've titled a ready wedding here, uh, we are looking, just simply in your, your notes here, at the third of three parables dealing with G, uh, the rejection of Jesus' authority, right? Back in chapter 21, uh, we see that, right? They're questioning, what, what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And he gives them this parable. Now, we could possibly interpret verse number one of chapter 22 that this is actually not connected with that particular episode. So it may not necessarily be the third of three. Maybe there were just those two, you know, they, that were back to back. Because in verse number one, it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. Well, Matthew could have just inserted this there. And so, you know, whether or not this was exactly following up on that, I think it was. I think it does make sense for it to fall on the the realm of of his authority, right? They're questioning his authority, and uh, Jesus is going to address them, right? He's going to address the chief priests and the elders here, right? That's what he addressed regarding the two sons, right? That's what he addressed regarding the householder uh, and uh, the 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 husbandmen. And how wicked those farmers were, the husbandmen were, and now here the marriage feast. 
And so we, we want to consider what Jesus is going to teach regarding this parable. But we also have to understand that this parable is not the same as the parable that we've already studied in Luke chapter 14, a message there that I titled, Supper is Ready. So in Luke chapter 14, we have a different parable. Now they're very similar, and sometimes it's those similarities of these parables that we get confused that, oh, isn't this kind of the same parable? Uh, matter of fact, some of your Bibles may even have a reference there back to Luke chapter uh, number 14. My Bible does, and I have in my Bible, it's not the same one. You can refer me back over there, but they're not the same parables. Why aren't they the same parables? Well, uh, here's, here's a, a, a reason. Um, I, I printed out kind of a, uh, a, a little parallel of the two passages, and I highlighted in my uh, notes here um, kind of what uh, those, those two parables speak of. In uh, Matthew chapter 22, uh, it speaks of that this is referring to the kingdom of heaven. We never hear that over in Luke's account. Uh, in Matthew's account, this is a certain king. In Luke's account, it's a certain man. In Matthew's account, it's a marriage for his son. In uh, Luke chapter 14, it was uh, just simply a great supper. In uh, Matthew's account, it's the, the servants are to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And the Luke account is just simply those servants uh, who at supper time bid many to come for the supper. So not for the marriage per se. Um, in Matthew's account, the, um, those who were bidden made light of the invitation. Verse 20 or verse 6 says, uh, and they took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But in Luke's account, that parable just simply says that those that were bidden with one consent began to make excuse. In Matthew's account, um, uh, they were told to go into the highways. And so those servants went out into the highways in Luke's account. They went quickly into the streets and lanes and then eventually went out into the highways and hedges. So there's some similarities, but they're different, okay? And so as you look at these two, uh, or if you, as we look at this passage here, I want us to understand that I do believe that what Jesus is going to teach, he is teaching this parable or he is giving this parable in response to, again, their rejection of his authority. And we'll see how that plays out here in just a moment. Second thing in your notes here, this parable sets up the contempt of Israel for God's great kingdom feast. And so he's going to speak about this king, right, who was having a feast for the, the marriage of his son, okay? Now, there's a very close link. Keep your place here, but turn with me to Revelation 19, Revelation 19. Verse number 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, speaking of the angel. I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here we have in Revelation 19 that there is the marriage of the Lamb. Of course, the Lamb is Jesus Christ. 
The end of verse number 7 says, His wife hath made herself ready. I believe that wife there is the church. And then what happens? Once they're married, verse 9, you have the marriage supper. I believe that what Jesus is expressing in Matthew 22 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, how do you arrive at that conclusion, right? I mean, are we jumping to, to some kind of uh, separate conclusions here, trying to find out, I mean, or, oh, okay, this kind of sounds similar. Well, it's similar to the Luke 14 passage where it's talking about the, 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 the supper that, that this, this certain man just wants to have, you know. But what we find out, uh, again, uh, about the two different parables here, um, again, is the fact that that the the parable here um, is again before the 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 uh, elders and the chief priests at the temple, where the supper the the uh, supper being ready in Luke's account is in a man's house. The the parable here is is speaking about a wedding where the parable there is just speaking about the feast. But this is lending itself to what eventually will happen regarding the supper with the marriage of the lamb to his bride. Throughout the supper, you know, or throughout the, the Luke's passage, right? I think we, we need to keep them in in. in you know, somewhat of a, of a context together, that there was dealing specifically with salvation. This one here is dealing with salvation, but the culmination of that salvation then is what? This fellowship that we have with God. It's, it's the feast. It's not just the marriage, but then it's the feast. And that is, again, what uh, Revelation 19 is speaking about, is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and what a glorious day that is going to be. And that won't happen until just before the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, right? The marriage uh, of the Lamb and the bride, and uh, therefore seven years of tribulation. And then following that, we have this incredible marriage supper of the Lamb. And then, of course, the inauguration of the millennial reign of Christ. With that in mind, we find this parable, okay? So let's look at this, this parable and understand, again, Israel's contempt for God's kingdom. So, again, does this have to do with Jesus' authority? Of course it does, right? Because that's what Jesus is speaking about, right? The authority that he has as the king to then what? Have a kingdom and what? They're rejecting that. So let's look at three things that we find here. First of all, in verses 1 through 7, we see the call to come. The call to come. Again, before you can get to the actual marriage feast, you have to be invited. There has to be a call to come. And so we find that, beginning in verse number 2, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. All right, so it's very clear, makes a marriage for his son, right? Hey, we're, we're going to celebrate now. So what, verse 3, he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. But what? They would not come, Right? We understand that God's invitation does go out to all people. God doesn't limit his invitation. The invitation is open to all. God is no respecter of persons. God desires for all to come to repentance. Right? And so, so here this invitation goes, goes out. Hey, everyone, just want to let you know what? There's going to be a marriage. I want you to come to the marriage, and uh, following the marriage, there's going to be this great feast. So everyone come. Come on out. Come on out. Now, 
understand something that we, we understand from a, a, a Jewish perspective here, that as you think of this and as you think about uh, the, the kind of invitations that do come uh, regarding that, is when, when the invitation goes out, it usually goes out a little bit beforehand, right? It might be a week beforehand. It might be a couple days beforehand. But hey, this is coming. Remember, we talked about that during the, the, the supper, being ready. Hey, it, it's going to happen. But an hour before it actually takes place, another invitation goes out. Well, this is what's going on. And so he says, hey, go out there and, uh, and I'm going to send forth my servants in verse number three to call them that were bidden. This first call that goes forth or the first servants that go out with this call are the prophets. This call is seen in God sending the prophets who foretold of the Messiah's salvation. Right? And again, as we've seen in the previous two parables, right? Both the two sons and the, uh, the wicked farmers, what? Hey, you guys have heard the prophets, all right? These, these prophets have been prophesying about a coming king, uh, about a Messiah, about one who is, who is truly going to deliver us. Now, again, remember, they're all thinking about actual physical deliverance from the Roman emperor, right? And Jesus says, no, that's not my purpose. My purpose is to deliver you from your sin, right? And so the invitation goes, goes out. But what happens? Verse number four, he what? He sent forth other servants. So not only do you have the prophets, but then he sent out other servants. Secondly, next came the apostles and Jesus himself. What? Share the complete news of salvation that's being offered. All right, here they are. They're, they're what? They're going forth in order to, to what? Invite people to come. But at the end of verse number 3, it says what? They would not come. Verse number 4. He sent forth other servants, saying, tell, him, tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But what? They made light of it. They didn't just make excuses like in, the, in the Luke's uh, parable. But what? They made light of it. Or maybe we could say this. They just didn't think that it was that important. I've got other things going on. Right? And how many people do you know of who have, you have appealed and sought to persuade regarding the gospel message? And, and what do they do? Well, not, not now. Remember that happened even in Paul's day. Almost thou persuadest me. Right? You were really close. You did a good job, but you just couldn't get me across the finish line. Right? And there are always going to be people that way. And so Jesus is speaking about the fact that what? You guys have heard from the prophets. You've heard from, you, you know, uh, the apostles here, the disciples who have gone forth. And, and you've heard from me. And, and what? You, you still won't come. But this time, the, it goes a little further. Verse number 6 says, The remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Again, this is a prophecy of what they're going to do with, you know, last week we saw, um, you know, the wicked farmers, what they did to the sun. Well, here you have the remnant that what took his servants and, uh, you know, they, they treated them spitefully and slew them. So as we look at this, we, we have to understand that, that, that what? There are people who will reject and that leads us to the third point there, and that is this, these servants, um, uh, Israel willfully reject, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't have put uh, Israel there. Um, the servants willfully rejected, uh, or um, uh, I'm sorry, not the servants, the, uh, um, the bidden willfully rejected the call. So cross off servants there and put the bidden 
uh, the bidden or these that were bidden uh, to come. What, what, what did they do? They just rejected. No, nope, not, not really interested. And uh, I, I've got other things. You know, they made light of it. They went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, right? And that's, is that not the same thing that happens in our day, how people will reject the gospel because of what? Oh, it might be merchandise, right? I'm, I'm too involved in, in money. I'm too involved in, in business. I'm too involved in work right now. I don't have time for that. And, uh, and here they are. They're being bidden. But notice, secondly, not only th- do they reject this, but then notice God now addresses the, the servants to continue on. And so we see, secondly, not only the call to come, but secondly, the command to obey. The command to obey. And he starts off in verse number 7, and it says this, When the king heard thereof... He was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage." So the, the command isn't just to the servants, but the command is to those who were bidden. Now he's introducing us to another group of people that are bidden, those who are now in the highways or around the highways, right? The highways here implies those that, that are just kind of out there. They're, they're not uh, the ones that were on the first invitation list, if you will, right? Which would be... Uh, uh, certainly um, the, the, the Jewish people and especially the religious ones, but now even those who weren't the religious ones, but those who were just kind of on the fringe, but may even perhaps be some of the strangers. And, and so what does he do? He tells the servants, tell them the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So go to the highways and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage, let them come. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found. I love this next phrase. Both bad and good. Both bad and good. Well, I thought there's none good. No, not one. Right? I mean, hey, oh man, I mean, how do you... How do you justify that? Well, no, the, the phraseology here is perhaps referring to those bad who would be the Gentiles and the good who would be Israel. And so he's just simply saying, listen, I don't care who they are. I don't care whether they're, uh, they're, they're bad people, they're good people, whatever they, they possibly think of themselves, right? I want you to go and bid them and what? Bring them in. Right in verse number 10 continues on, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So we see a couple things here. First of all, since those who had initially been invited did not come, the king gave strict orders to the servants to go out into the highways. Right? Just go out there. I don't care who's out there in the highways, the good and the bad, just go and invite them. And what? Invite uh, them to the wedding feast. And, and as we think about that, uh, think about how God has laid out his plan of evangelism. Right? His plan of evangelism really hasn't changed. We can even go back into the Old Testament Israel. Right? God's plan has never changed. God's plan was Abram, go uh, leave Ur the Chaldees and go to a land that I'm going to uh, promise you and that I'm going to give you there. And through you, you are going to bless the nations around you. Right? God's plan of evangelism has never changed. Jesus is going to get ready to tell the disciples in just a few days that what? 
you are going to go and you're going to preach the gospel, right? You're going to tell people what happened to me. You know, I died and I was buried in a tomb and on the third day I rose again. And as he comes out of that tomb, he then gives him the great commission in Matthew chapter 28 to what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go to the highways, go to the hedges, right? And tell people that what? The gospel invitation is ready. It's available. You can be saved. In Acts, you see a kind of an outline throughout the first chapters of the book of Acts. And it was an invitation to the, the good, Israel, right? Jesus would give that model in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Judea, uh, Jerusalem and Judea. Then you're going to go to Samaria and eventually what? To the uttermost parts of the world. You're going to go to the good, that is right here in Israel, and you're going to go to the bad. You're going to go to the uttermost parts of the world, the Gentiles, the dogs. You're going to go everywhere. And I want you to go and invite them to what? Come. I want you to compel them to come. I want you to command them to come because there's only one way in this, this order that he gives to these servants here. He's not taking lightly. In verse number 11, it says, When the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And that leads us to third part of this parable. And that is the conditions to meet. The conditions to meet. You see, God's invitation of salvation is open to all. But there is a condition upon it. If we were to sit there and think that, you know what, everyone in the world is going to heaven. Why? Because we're all God's children, right? And there are some people that have that mindset, right? There, there are some people that believe that, you know what, God is greater than the, than the devil. And so, you know what, in, in the end, love wins. Right? And, and God's plan of salvation is far greater than the devil's plan of, you know, chaos and confusion and all this. And, and uh, so, so, of course, you know, everyone is going to heaven when they die. You know, and, and we're all going to just sing Kumbaya and it's all going to be wonderful because none of us deserve salvation. And God just will bring salvation because he's God and he can do it. There are some that believe that. The problem with that belief is that it's not biblical, right? So listen to the conditions that Jesus gives here. Really just one condition. When the king came in to see, verses 11 again, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. If we understood Jewish culture, what would happen, you know, think about this, these are all people that are what? They're, they're out in the highway. They're, they're, they're not in their homes getting all dressed, ready for the wedding. All right, where's my tie? Get my tie, honey, you know, and give me some cologne, spray me down so I smell good, you know, and ah, I got to get ready for this wedding. No, these are people that are out on the highways, right? They're, they're just out mulling around they're 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 just kind of minding their own business they're doing their own things and all of a sudden this this servant comes along and says hey hey, hey i just want to let you know there there's a wedding going on and after the wedding there's going to be a great feast just come oh what okay yeah great oh what are you going to have t-bone steak yeah sure great it's going to be great right it's going to be wonderful oh i get this free steak and all this yeah i'm i'm on my way and what they they show up and what the king would do at that time is he would what? Give them garments to wear. So all of a sudden, the king's looking around. And he's seeing all these people. Oh, they, it looks so nice. You know, it, you know the people that I, I invited earlier, they rejected. But these people that came from the highways, you know, wow. I mean, they, they look nice. They, they're all dressed in this beautiful wedding garment. And then all of a sudden, he's looking around. That guy stands out. Why? He doesn't have on a wedding garment. Okay, so here's the, 
the point that Jesus is making, right? You guys remember the context. You guys have rejected my authority. God has given you incredible grace. God has granted you incredible mercy. Whether you're the good or the bad, whether you're the ones who were bidden or the ones who were in the highway, God has given this to you. And now all of a sudden you're, you've entered. You think you're fine because you're at the wedding. You see, all these chief priests and these elders... They're at the wedding, but what? They don't have the right garment on. Why? The person who is not wearing the garment here, it wasn't because it wasn't provided for him. It's because he rejected it. Notice how he states it in verse number 12. He saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And what he was speechless. What do I say now? Every one of them would have been provided a garment. And this individual decided, don't need it. So, verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, what Jesus is pointing out here, that the condition to meet, these are rigid requirements that must be met in order to enter the kingdom of God. Whether Jew or Gentile, every individual must meet the same requirement to enter the wedding feast. You may be in, but you're not dressed properly. You may be Abraham's seed, but you're not going to be part of the kingdom of God. Why? Because the only way to be a part of the kingdom of God is to be clothed or robed in the righteousness of Christ. There's no other way. You can't come in in your own garb, your own garments. You have to come in robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, he says, many are called, but what few are chosen? Meaning this, you know, I know some take that out of context, right? As, as far as what I'm saying, or some, I believe, misinterpret it. And, and I know, you know, there's good arguments on, on both sides. Um, but I believe that what he's saying here is, you know, those of you, that have been bidden, or the, which they're the ones who've already rejected, right? But these are ones coming from the highways, and yet what? They won't even put on the garment that was provided by the king. God has provided you scribes, you elders, you chief priests with garments. But what? You're rejecting it. I am the garment. And you keep saying, whose authority? What authority do you have? We reject you, Jesus. And what is the result of them? It's what? They're going to take them. They're going to cast them into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they must be clothed in the wedding garment of righteousness, which is only found in Jesus Christ. Many hear the gospel call, but few choose to receive it. Whose fault? It's not the king's fault. It's not the servant's fault. It's this one who has entered in. And what? Jesus even refers to him in verse 12 in this way. Friend. Right? He's still a friend, but what? You're not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so, those who reject the invitation do so willingly. 
and are therefore justly excluded from the kingdom, right? That's how we started. The kingdom of heaven is like this. You can't enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you are robed properly. And the way to be robed is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Why? Because all your righteousness are filthy rags. You see how he, he, he puts this together. And so as we, we close, we think about a, a central truth here. A um, couple thoughts to, to kind of help us with this. First of all, the Pharisees who received to, re, to accept Jesus would not enter the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter how, quote unquote, righteous they are. It doesn't matter how religious they are. It doesn't matter that they are the seed of Abraham. It what? They have refused to enter by the way of Jesus Christ. And these three parables, all together as a unit taught, that those who followed the pharisaical way of life were not true sons of the kingdom. The kingdom had been offered to them, and now it's what? It's going to be offered to another people. Right? And that marriage supper of the Lamb is the culmination. Starts with an invitation. But then what? When they are married to the Lamb and have the right garments on so they will be able to fellowship with the Father. And so what we learn from this, and let me just close with Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 21, he says, But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And so here's the thought. Be careful not to follow their example of disobedience. I've stretched out my hand. And what? You still reject. You're a disobedient people. And the only way that you can enter is through the righteousness of Christ. Aren't you thankful that our gain of heaven, our entrance into the marriage supper of the Lamb is not because of what we've done. It's all because of what Jesus Christ did in our acceptance of Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these, these parables. And Lord, as we look at this parable here, Lord, this is leading up to his, his death and his crucifixion. And Father, yet he's, he's reaching out to them once again. Lord, of how they can be saved. And Lord, we, we live in a day and age, we live in a culture today that that people may, may think that religion is, is good enough for them. But Lord, it's not about a religious practice. It's about a relationship. It's about the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace. You're not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. And so, Lord, help us to... Even learn from these, uh, these servants, Lord, to go out into the highways. Whether it's good or bad people, Lord, you, you bid them. You invite them to come. And so, Lord, help us to be faithful in doing our part as well. So thank you again for these parables, Lord, the great lessons that we can learn through them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.